Howdy folks, I hope you've all had a great weekend and welcome to another episode of Mingles with Jingles. So, what are we going to talk about this week? Well, I might as well just crack on straight ahead and actually answer some of your questions. This week's first question comes from Sworn Oblivion, and I like this question because it seems kind of boring at first, but then I realised actually this allows me to talk about World War II, so it's actually, you know, a good question. And the question is, Hello Jingles, what's your opinion on the British transport system? I told you it sounded like a boring question. My train was delayed for 21 minutes today. Well, you got off kind of lightly then. <laughs> uh, but the reason, or one of the many reasons for the woeful inefficiency of the British public transport system, actually has its roots in World War II. You see, Britain was in the relatively fortunate position during World War II of being one of the very few countries in Europe that didn't get the shit comprehensively bombed out of it during the course of the war. I mean, a lot of our cities did during the Blitz, but the transport infrastructure was more or less left intact. You know, unless a random bomb managed to hit a city train station, that was about it. So this was great. It meant that in the run-up to D-Day, for example, we were able to use a mostly untouched transportation infrastructure to ferry troops and supplies and equipment and everything that you needed around the country in order to mount an amphibious invasion of Europe. And we were heavily reliant on our rail network because Britain didn't actually have any motorways at that point. Germany had the autobahns, but they didn't have any trucks or cars, so... <laughs> They had a bit of an embarrassment of riches, and Germany, like France in the run-up to D-Day, had its rail network bombed to hell and back by the Royal Air Force and the US Army Air Force. Tens of thousands of tons of bombs dropped on train stations, marshalling yards, checkpoints, basically anything that looked like it moved and resembled a train or something associated with a train got bombed. Now, the reason we did this, obviously, was to make life difficult for the Germans during the invasion of Normandy. For example, the 2nd SS Panzer Division, when it eventually received its orders to travel across France to the beaches of Normandy and throw the Allied invaders back into the sea, a trip that should have taken a day if it had been able to actually use the rail networks, ended up taking around about two weeks. And the few tanks that did actually manage to make it to Normandy were so buggered after driving halfway across France under their own steam, and at which point it was far too late anyway. So, as far as the destruction of the French rail infrastructure was concerned, that was a big, fat mission accomplished on behalf of the Allies. Now, the post-war consequences of this bombing for both France and Germany were that once the smoke had cleared and everybody had surrendered, and the actual process of rebuilding began, France and Germany in particular both pretty much had a clean slate. Uh, they didn't have anything to rebuild. They mostly had to start again from scratch. And so they did it logically and efficiently and planned a nice, efficient, cost-effective rail transportation network, which is what both of those countries have today. Nice, efficient and modern rail networks built with nice, efficient and modern American money after the war, which is kind of ironic when you consider that France and Germany were... Uh, two countries that both shot at and killed Americans during World War II. Wait, what do you mean? France? Yes, yes. Look at the Allied landings in North Africa during Operation Torch. It was the French who were defending the beaches against the American amphibious troops, not the Germans. But anyway, I digress. So while America was busy paying for its former enemies uh, to have nice new modern rebuilt countries... And I realise I'm simplifying things drastically here, and I'm probably going to catch no amount of shit in the comments for it, but America wasn't doing this out of the goodness of its heart. It was doing this for some very, very good reasons. Uh, first, it was determined that there was going to be no repetition of what happened at the end of World War I. Germany crushed and humiliated, sowing the seeds of resentment that would allow the Nazi party to come to power and World War II to happen. And America also wanted a nice, strong democratic Europe because it recognised that there was a fairly serious threat developing to the east in the form of communist Russia. 
So this was great news for France and Germany in particular, helping themselves to nice big fat slices of that American pie. And Britain would have loved to have had a nice big fat slice of that American pie, but we'd already had our slice back in 1939 and 1940, when American money and around about 50 obsolete American World War I destroyers were some of the few things that allowed us to actually remain the only country in the world still actively fighting against Germany. And so while America was giving money away to France and Germany, they were demanding that we pay the money back. And we were bankrupt. What's this got to do with the rail network? Well, when you don't have a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of, rebuilding an intact rail network is very, very low on your list of priorities. And our intact rail network was built in the 19th century. And while France and Germany had been sitting down and saying to themselves, what's the most efficient and cost-effective way to build a national rail network, that's not how the British rail network had developed. It wasn't how the French and German rail networks had developed either, but theirs had both been blown up, so they kind of had to start again. Back in Britain, what had happened was that it would be recognised that there was a need to transport goods and all services from point A to point B, and so somebody would found a company to build a railway link between point A and point B, buy some railway engines and then operate them as a company. And then this would happen all over the country, all of these various different companies competing against each other to establish rail links, not in any planned way. And then eventually the rail network would spread so far that the lines would interconnect. And so you'd end up with what was to all intents and purposes, a national rail network, but it had never been planned as a national rail network. Not all of the railway lines were the same gauge. <laughs> and, um, and it just, it kind of worked, but not because anybody had planned it that way. And it was not terribly efficient. And we were kind of stuck with it. And we kind of still are today. <laughs> and so that's one of the reasons why the British public transport system absolutely sucked. Ironically enough, immediately after World War II in 1948, things did get a lot better because prior to that point, all of the rail lines throughout the country were owned and operated by different companies. So it meant that what should be a journey between point A and point B, which should take maybe three hours, actually became a journey between point A, B, C, D, E, F and G, which ended up taking eight hours because all the various different points of track along that route were owned by different companies, which meant that you had to keep changing trains every 30 miles or so. In 1948, the British Rail Network was nationalised and was run by the government, so that kind of did away with all that kind of nonsense. However, it brought its own problems because a nationalised industry has no competitors and therefore doesn't really feel any pressing need to provide a decent level and quality of service. Fast forward to the 1990s and the British Conservative government is doing the level best to sell off and privatise every publicly owned company in the land, including British Rail. But they managed to do it in that typically British incompetent way that ensured that we ended up with the worst rather than the best of both worlds. With a nationalised rail network there's no competition, you have a monopoly, and so there's no real commercial pressure to provide a decent level of service. Other countries with nationalised rail companies do somehow manage to provide a decent level of service. It's because they actually have government oversight of those nationalised rail companies, something that successive British governments didn't seem to think was terribly important. The way that they split up the various different sections of track effectively granted monopolies to the private companies that were running those sections of track. So once again, no real commercial pressure for them to provide any decent level of service. And then, of course, the way that they split up the sections of track among the various different private companies did mean that if you were travelling from the north to the south or the south to the north, you could expect and anticipate a relatively efficient journey with few changes of train. But if you were travelling from the west to the east or the east to the west, you were going to cross sections of track that were owned and operated by three, four, five, or maybe even six different companies. With all of the chaos and confusion that that guarantees. Let me just give you a couple of examples from my time in the Navy when I would be travelling home on the weekend. Now, when I was based in Portsmouth, I would have to travel to London and then from London up to Newcastle upon Tyne, which is where I lived. So this was a trip of around about 400 miles and it would take about an hour and a half to get to London, 
say, an hour to get across London to King's Cross train station heading north, and then the trip from King's Cross to Newcastle would take about four hours. So that's a 400 mile journey that took six hours, and I only had to make two connections. I would change once at Waterloo to get the underground to King's Cross, where I would change back to the rail network, and then it was a direct line from King's Cross London all the way to Newcastle. Two different companies operating those routes, two train connections. Now let's contrast that with a journey travelling west to east across the country. This time I'm still in the Navy, but I now live in Portsmouth. I'm still based in Portsmouth, but for whatever reason my ship or myself happens to be in Plymouth. Maybe the ship's there doing exercises and training. Maybe I'm attending a course at the supply school in Plymouth, whatever. I'm in Plymouth, it's the weekend, I want to go home to Portsmouth for the weekend. Remember, it takes six hours to travel the 400 miles, it's actually slightly more than 400 miles from Portsmouth to Newcastle. Travelling the 170 miles, less than half the distance between Plymouth and Portsmouth, if I'm extremely lucky and none of the trains are delayed and I make every connection on time, I'm going to be lucky if I get home in less than four and a half, more likely five hours. My record for that journey is 10 hours. <laughs> yep, I'm not making that up. 170 miles on British trains in the 1990s and it took 10 hours. I could have done it faster on a bicycle. So yeah, the British rail network absolutely sucks. And one of the reasons is because we were lucky enough to not have it obliterated from the air by German bombers during World War II. The next question that I wanted to answer this week came from Bart van... I'll have a stab at pronouncing your name, I suspect he's Dutch. Bart van Herwegen? I've probably gotten it wrong, but hopefully you recognise your name, or you'll certainly recognise the question. I suspect that this question was posted in response to the World of Warships video I did last week, the battle for Cape Matapan. And his question is this. I'm going to quote his question directly, so go easy on him because English isn't his first language, but here it is. It's quite a long question, so bear with us. Dear Jingles, I've had this question since as long as I can remember hearing you talk about the Italian Navy way back. The thing that bothered me is, you said the Italian Navy did not have the fuel and did not have radar, or they would have been a fantastic threat as a combatant. Yet they were part of the Axis. Same goes for Hungary and Romania in the fight against Russia. But, well, here's the thing my logic brain can't get around. Why did the Germans not simply give radars for the Italian ships? Or help them build them, or just provide plans of their radars so they could have radar? And why did the Germans not just give them fuel to operate in the Mediterranean? Wouldn't that only have helped Rommel and have provided the German fleet with less pressure there and more to operate somewhere else? and provide them with an actual chance to win in the Mediterranean, so there couldn't have been an invasion of Italy, where they then again had to split their forces to go help instead of send them to Russia. The last one was again something that kept bugging me. During the siege of Stalingrad, the flanks were guarded by the Italian, Hungarian and other Eastern European armies, but they didn't have any good materials like good tanks, field guns and anti-tank guns. Why didn't the Germans just provide them with German tanks and weapons and planes? Surely that would be far easier than sending an army to Italy to defend there. Or knowing that the flanks are secure because they actually had the materials and weapons to fight with. I just never understood this logic of not giving your allies the materials they needed to actually fight. The allies did, and look, it worked. This is actually a really good question. In fact, it's a bunch of really good questions. The answers, however, to all of these questions are actually relatively simple. And they boil down to two major factors. First and foremost, Germany just didn't trust its allies. And secondly, Germany often didn't have enough supplies, equipment and material for its own armies and just couldn't afford to give any spare to its allies. Germany definitely could, however, afford to give radar, or if not actual functioning radar sets, at least the technology for the Italians to build their own radar and you could argue that if the Japanese Navy had radar in 1941, they wouldn't have lost the Battle of Cape Matapan as comprehensively as they did against the British Mediterranean Fleet, which did have radar, and allowed them to utterly obliterate an entire Italian heavy cruiser division and a bunch of destroyers in a night battle. Or would they? 
because the US Navy had radar, and even with radar, during a night battle in the early stages of the Guadalcanal campaign off Savo Island, or possibly Savo Island, I've never really been sure how to pronounce that, the US cruisers suffered such catastrophic battle casualties at night against a numerically inferior Japanese cruiser force that did not have the benefit of radar, a defeat so bad that the details were kept secret from the American public for six months. Having radar is good. Having radar and knowing how to actually use it effectively is better. And to be fair to the Americans, they did learn. But a lot of sailors were going to get killed before that happened. It's doubtful whether or not the Italian Navy would have been able to develop the tactics and doctrine necessary in the time that they had to be actually able to use that radar effectively, even if the Germans had shared the technology with them. But Germany was never going to share that technology with the Italians because the technology was top secret and Germany just didn't trust her allies. Now, onto the subject of fuel. Couldn't Germany have just provided the fuel oil that the Italian fleet needed to be able to operate effectively in its own backyard, the Mediterranean? The Italian Navy was kind of hamstrung by its geographical location in World War II. It was slap bang in the middle of the Mediterranean. And there are only three ways in or out of the Mediterranean. One of them's a bit of a dead end, and it only goes as far as Russia, and you have to get through the Turks. Um, and the other two were both controlled by the British, Gibraltar and the Suez Canal. This was one of the reasons why Italy was so keen to embark on its North African adventures. The only problem, as Rommel discovered as well in North Africa, was that North African armies have to be mobile due to the vast distances involved. There are very few train lines in North Africa and they're easily interdicted. And whereas the British had plenty of fuel arriving in Alexandria via the Suez Canal, if the Germans and Italians wanted to resupply their North African armies with fuel, they had to transport that fuel across the Mediterranean in ships. And what do ships need in order to be able to move? Yep, the same fuel that is required by the tanks and trucks and everything that's operating in North Africa. So they were having to spend fuel in order to transport fuel, and a lot of those transports were getting sunk by the Royal Navy because Italy didn't really control the Mediterranean. Well, yeah, but if they'd given some of that fuel to the Italians, maybe they would have been able to control the Mediterranean. Well, doubtful, because they still had to defeat the Royal Navy. And just look at the Battle of Cape Matapan as an example of what happened on those rare occasions when the Italian Navy did actually have enough fuel of its own to put to sea and go looking for a fight. They lost an entire heavy cruiser division and a whole bunch of destroyers, as well as having a battleship crippled. Germans just didn't have enough fuel to go around for their own forces. And they just didn't trust the Italians to be able to fight. Which isn't entirely fair. I mean, it's a bit of a meme that Italian weapons for sale never fired in anger, only dropped once, you know. <laughs> it's, but it's not entirely fair because there was an Italian tank division, the 132nd Italian Armoured Division. It was known as the Ariete Division. In fact, the modern-day Italian main battle tank is named after it. And they did actually have a very good combat record in North Africa on those few occasions when they actually had the fuel to be able to operate effectively. But generally speaking, Germans just didn't trust their allies. And that brings us to the next point. What if the Germans had equipped the Hungarian and Romanian armies at Stalingrad, who were guarding the southern sector, with German equipment, tanks, anti-tank guns, weapons, artillery, all the good stuff. Would that have made any difference at Stalingrad? Well, actually, they did. The 1st Romanian Armoured Division, which consisted of 121 R2 light tanks, which were basically Panzer 35Ts produced in Czechoslovakia, as well as a bunch of German Panzer 3s and 4s. And on the 20th of November 1942, they took the initial attack of the 19th Tank Brigade of the Soviet 26th Tank Corps. And by the end of the day, the Romanians, using their German tanks, had destroyed 62 Soviet tanks and only lost 25 of their own. Two days later, fighting renewed, and the Romanians again destroyed 65 more Soviet tanks while only losing 10 of their own. The problem that the Romanians had wasn't that they didn't have good equipment. They did have good equipment. They had equipment that was at least as good as what the Germans had because it was German equipment. 
but they had the same problem that the Germans had with their German equipment. They couldn't replace it fast enough. They were at the tail end of a logistics chain that was 2,000 miles long and being attacked by partisans and guerrillas every couple of miles along the way. By contrast, the Russian tank factories were much closer. In fact, earlier on in the fighting around Stalingrad, the Red Banner tractor factory inside Stalingrad was still building tanks and sending them out to fight in the middle of the battle. But the Russians had the advantage, well, I say the Russians, it was the Soviets. They had the advantage of massively superior industrial capacity. They could just build tanks in greater numbers and faster than Germany and her allies could. And they also didn't have to send them as far to actually get them into the battle. And also, because the Russians had the luxury of picking the time and location of the attack, they prepared beforehand and stockpiled huge supplies of munitions, fuel, spare tanks, reserve troops, everything that they needed to keep the battle going for as long as it took. And the battle did actually take quite a while. I mean, there's this huge misconception in the West that once the Russian counterattack started in the winter of 1942, that all of the Italians and Hungarians and Romanians just threw the weapons down and ran away, leaving the Germans to fend for themselves. And that's simply not true. I mean, it is true that some of the Russian tank armies just rolled right over some of the Italian, Hungarian and Romanian divisions. But they just rolled right over some of the German divisions as well. The 1st Romanian Armoured Division actually held its positions and kept fighting until the 1st of January 1943, when they were forced to abandon their positions and retreat, not due to combat losses. Although, at that point, they only had about 40 of their Panzer 35T light tanks left and none of their Panzer 3s and 4s. But when they did retreat, they had to leave almost half of their tanks behind. 54 Panzer 35Ts, and not because they'd been knocked out in action, but because they didn't have the fuel to run them, or because they didn't have the spare parts to repair them when they'd broken down. So it wasn't really a case of the Germans keeping all of the good shit for themselves and not sparing any of it for their allies. The Germans were having to leave tanks behind because they didn't have the fuel to run them, or they didn't have the spare parts to repair them as well. In fact, the Germans left an entire army behind, which is not something that can be said of the Romanians or the Hungarians or even the Italians. So the idea that the Germans never gave their allies the materials and equipment and fuel and logistics and supplies that they needed to fight effectively isn't really true. I mean, we've all heard stories about Germany refusing to share resources with her allies. The Italians in North Africa are often pointed to as a great example, and they are a good example. There are stories about Italian troops who were starving. And that's not just because of the stranglehold that the British fleet had on supplies crossing the Mediterranean, but also because the Italian officers tended to be hopelessly corrupt and would often keep all of the supplies for themselves. And the Italian troops would have to go begging to their German allies. But while that definitely happened, it wasn't always the case. The Germans were quite generous to their allies, but only when they could afford to be, because their allies often needed exactly the kind of things that the Germans were short of as well. Fuel, equipment, tanks, artillery, anti-tank guns. And it's not as if the Germans were all superbly well equipped at Stalingrad either. Remember the German 6th Army was fighting a winter battle in 1942 still equipped with summer clothing. So the Germans kind of had their own problems. And yet at the same time that the German 6th Army was fighting off massed Russian counterattacks in the middle of winter while wearing summer uniforms, to their south, the 1st Romanian Armoured Division was fighting back the same attacks, equipped exclusively with German weapons and equipment. But suffering from exactly the same problems that the Germans, using exactly the same equipment, were suffering. It wasn't that they didn't have the equipment, it was that they couldn't afford to fuel or repair what they had. Anyway, very good question, thank you for that, and I hope you're satisfied with the answer. Well, we're going to end this week's episode of Mingles with Jingles with a recounting of one of my favourite naval stories ever. I've been motivated to do this as a result of last week's episode of Mingles with Jingles, where one of you asked that I retell the story of the 80-year-old Russian shepherd who won a fight with a brown bear. Now, the episode of Mingles with Jingles where I originally told that story was lost in the apocalypse, which is what prompted people to ask me to retell the story because they couldn't find the original episode anymore. And the story of the Voyage of the Damned. <laughs> if you haven't heard, uh, or if you don't know what I'm about to talk about, oh boy are you in for a treat. <laughs>
<laughs> uh, but I've been itching for an excuse to retell this story for quite some time and the fact that the original episode where I told the story for the first time was also lost in the apocalypse is the only excuse that I need. So I do need to warn you however before I start retelling this story that you're going to think that I'm either making shit up <laughs> or I'm wildly exaggerating. I promise you that everything you're about to hear is 100% true recorded historical fact. When the truth is as crazy as this, there is absolutely no need to exaggerate. On the 18th of February 1904, Japan, which was competing against Russia for territory in Manchuria and Korea, opened hostilities with a surprise attack on the Russian naval base at Port Arthur. They sank two battleships and a cruiser. In August the Russians attempted to break out which resulted in a second defeat. The surviving Russian ships were now either contained and blockaded in Port Arthur, Vladivostok or the friendly ports that they'd run away to. In response to this the complete defeat of the Russian Far Eastern fleet, Tsar Nicholas II authorised a proposal from his government to detach 45 ships from the Russian Baltic fleet sail 18,000 miles around the world, defeat the Japanese Navy and relieve Port Arthur, thus bringing about a swift end to the war because Japan completely relied on her navy to support her land forces. As you can no doubt imagine, there were a couple of problems associated with this plan. In order to complete an 18,000 mile voyage, the fleet would have to resupply and refuel en route. Unlike the Royal Navy, the Russians didn't have any bases around the globe and international treaties prevented them from using the ports of other friendly foreign powers such as France. So a plan to resupply the fleet was devised. They would charter freighters from the German Hamburg America line to refuel the ships at sea. Now that was going to be a lot more complicated than it sounds. Even today refueling ships at sea is a tricky business. It's largely routine but it's still tricky with all kinds of potential for things to go horribly horribly wrong. And this was in 1904. And as we're going to see later, even when this refueling went according to plan, it caused all kinds of problems. Now let's take a look at the Baltic fleet itself. On paper, this was a very powerful fleet, but only on paper. See, prior to the launch of HMS Dreadnought, which led to a standardised design for battleships, many ships of the day were a, well, bizarre mixture of different experiments in naval architecture, mostly untried in combat conditions. This often resulted in ships being top heavy as the latest innovations were added to the superstructure causing the vessels to become unstable. The French Navy was the most significant victim of this period of experimentation and lost several ships which had just keeled over and sunk due to design faults. The Baltic fleet suffered similar problems with some of its battleships being as much as one and a half thousand tons overweight. In practice this meant that the secondary armament was often underwater and couldn't be fired. The belt armour was often also below the waterline, offering no protection against enemy shells. An example of the hazards posed by these design flaws can be seen in one of the fleet's battleships, the Oriol, which sank while it was anchored in Kronstadt and had to be refloated. Shitty logistics and shitty ships were not the only two problems that the unfortunate admiral in charge of the expedition, Admiral Rozhevensky, had to face. He also had to worry about the quality of his crews. Most Russian naval crews were completely uneducated peasants, didn't come from the coastal areas of Russia, lacked any experience of the sea, and the Baltic fleet spent long periods of the year completely inactive because Russia's northern harbours were iced up for entire months at a time. This resulted in very limited time being available for actually training the crews in the intricacies of modern naval warfare. The state of affairs was so bad that one officer on the battleship Suvorov said of his gunnery crews, one half have to be taught everything because they know nothing, the other half because they've forgotten everything but if they do remember anything then it's obsolete. It's okay. To make matters worse it would later emerge that some of the ratings were members of various different communist revolutionary groups who actively tried to stir up unrest among the crews. In addition, Rozhevensky was also very dissatisfied with his senior officers. He referred to his overweight second-in-command Rear Admiral Fokersham has a manure sack 
and he described the cruiser commander, Rear Admiral Enkvist, as a vast empty space. Notwithstanding these difficulties, on the 16th of October 1904, the fleet, now rather optimistically renamed the Second Pacific Squadron, set sail from Latvia on its voyage. The tone for the expedition was set as the flagship ran aground <laughs> and one of the escorting cruisers lost its anchor chain. While the fleet waited for the flagship to refloat and the cruiser to retrieve its misplaced anchor, a destroyer accidentally rammed the battleship Osliaba and had to return to Tallinn for repairs. After overcoming these initial problems, the fleet sailed through the narrow waters between Sweden and Denmark. A note of hysteria set in as reports reached the fleet that Japanese torpedo boats were stationed off the Danish coast. The question of how <laughs> a Japanese torpedo boat squadron, which, remember, have a very limited range, not just in fuel but also in food for the crew, how would a Japanese torpedo boat squadron travel the 18,000 miles? That question was never asked. The rumours were further fuelled with talk of the Japanese having mined the seas and Japanese submarines being seen. This invoked a further outbreak of mass hysteria among the fleet. To quell this, Rozovensky then issued an order that no vessel of any sort must be allowed to get in amongst the fleet. So when two fishermen, delivering consular dispatches from the Tsar, approached the fleet, the Russians opened fire. Ironically, the two men, who were unharmed due to the appalling standards of Russian gunnery, had a personal message for the Admiral from Tsar Nicholas informing him that he'd now been promoted to Vice Admiral. For good measure, the repair ship, Kamchatka, signalled that she was under attack by torpedo boats. When asked how many, she replied, about eight from all directions. Unsurprisingly, this was a false alarm. The antics of the captain and crew of the Kamchatka would be the cause of several incidents of an increasingly hysterical nature later in the expedition. So, having survived attacks from phantom Japanese torpedo boats and submarines and having negotiated a non-existent minefield, the squadron sailed into the North Sea, where the Russians spotted the trawler fishing fleet from Hull on the Dogger Bank. The Russians identified the innocent trawlers as being yet more Japanese torpedo boats and opened fire, an incident which caused the 1904 war between Russia and Britain. Okay, it didn't, but it very nearly did. In the ensuing pandemonium, several Russian ships signalled that torpedoes had hit them. On the battleship Borodino, some of the crew put their life belts on and lay down on the deck, while others charged around, waving swords, shouting that the ship was being boarded by the Japanese, and panicked the fleet even more. The Russian battleships continued firing, damaging four British trawlers and sinking one. For good measure, they also managed to hit two of their own cruisers, the Aurora and the Donskoy, which had been subject to a bombardment from seven Russian battleships sailing in line-ahead formation. The following morning revealed a night of madness caused by mass hysteria amongst the Russians. Fortunately for the British trawlers and the two Russian cruisers, Russian gunnery was so bad that damage had been kept to a minimum. For example, the battleship Oriol had fired over 500 shells without hitting a thing. The Russian government was quick to apologise, but British public opinion and the media demanded war against Russia. 28 British battleships from the home fleet were ordered to raise steam and prepare for action, while British cruiser squadrons shadowed the Russian fleet as it crossed the Bay of Biscay and sailed down the Portuguese coast. Nearing Vigo, Rozovensky was ordered to dock and leave behind the officers who'd been responsible for attacking the British trawlers. He decided to use this opportunity to get rid of the officers that he hated the most. One of them went by the name of Captain Clado. Clado was ordered to return to St. Petersburg to organise reinforcements for the fleet. He decided to use this as an opportunity to get personal revenge on Rozovensky by rounding up old obsolete vessels which the Admiral has condemned as old tubs and jokingly referred to as the Sink by Themselves Squadron. The main fleet then approached Tangier, having lost contact with the Kamchatka for some days. Kamchatka eventually rejoined the fleet, reporting that she had fired 300 shells in an engagement with three Japanese ships, who were actually a Swedish merchantman, a German trawler and a French yacht. For good measure, as the fleet left Tangier, one ship managed to cut the city's underwater telegraph cable with her anchor which cut the city off from communication with Europe for four days. <laughs> 
The next phase in the operation was to rendezvous with 10 of the German supply ships off Dakar in Western Africa. Having made contact, the fleet then proceeded to take on double loads of coal. These extra loads had to be stored on the decks, which caused coal dust to spread throughout the entire ships. The coal dust, combined with the humid equatorial atmosphere, resulted in the death of some of the seamen who basically choked to death from breathing in the filthy black air which congested their lungs. Having been quiet for some days, the Kamchatka sent a new wave of panic throughout the fleet when she sent the wrong signal during a storm off the coast of Angola. Instead of issuing the code signal for, we are all right now, the message, do you see torpedo boats, <laughs> was signalled instead. As the fleet neared Cape Town, Rozhevensky received a signal that Clado was sending the reinforcements to join him. Knowing the quality of the ships, he decided to avoid a rendezvous with them at all costs. Yep, he had so little trust in the quality of his own reinforcements that he deliberately went out of his way to avoid making contact with them. At this point, morale amongst the fleet had reached an all-time low, with many of the crews convinced they were sailing to their destruction. In order to lift their spirits, the crews collected exotic pets while they were on shore visits, including a crocodile, yes really, and a poisonous snake that caused a panic on one battleship when it wrapped itself around the guns and then bit and poisoned the commanding officer. The fleet turned into a floating zoo, as a bizarre collection of birds and animals were left free to roam the decks. Events took a more severe downturn when the cooling plant on the Esperance, the fleet's refrigerated supply ship, broke down, and so a load of rotting meat had to be jettisoned, which resulted in the fleet being followed for hundreds of miles by hundreds of sharks. At Madagascar, events took a turn for the worse. For two weeks, the Admiral was severely ill and remained confined in his cabin. His chief of staff suffered a brain hemorrhage and was partially paralysed. No one was really in command of the fleet, and the crews spent increasing amounts of time ashore at various saloons, brothels and gambling houses. Disease broke out with daily deaths from malaria, dysentery and typhoid, and during the funeral for one of the dead, the Kamchatka fired a salute. Unfortunately, a live shell was used, which hit the cruiser Aurora, which was by now becoming used to being a mobile target for Russian gunnery. Mental illness from the long period at sea began to take a toll on the crews as a religious fervour broke out. The worst cases, together with a group of mutineers and revolutionaries from the Admiral Nakimov, were sent back to Russia on the supply ship Malay. Many of the fleet's officers were frequently drunk or drugged. One officer had bought 2,000 cigarettes in Madagascar, which turned out to be filled with opium. The fleet also needed to be resupplied with ammunition, having fired most of its shells in the battle with the British trawlers, sorry, Japanese torpedo boats. Spirits lifted when the supply ship Iritish arrived. It was expected to be carrying ammunition for the fleet. What it actually unloaded were 1,200 pairs, sorry, 12,000 pairs of fur-lined boots and a matching number of winter coats. Ideally suited to equatorial Africa, <laughs> where the fleet was now stationed. <laughs> to try and restore some semblance of order and battle readiness, the Admiral ordered gunnery practice. None of the destroyers scored any hits on a stationary target. Of the battleships, the flagship scored a single hit, which was on a ship towing a target, <laughs> a destroyer squadron, ordered to sail in line abreast formation, scattered, as the officers hadn't been issued with new code books. Seven torpedoes were fired, one of which jammed. Yeah, imagine having a live torpedo running in the launcher. That must have been fun for all involved. Three of the torpedoes swung off target, two chugged slowly and missed the target altogether, and one went around in a circle, causing ships to scatter in panic everywhere. <laughs> for good measure, the Kamchatka sent a signal saying she was sinking. On investigation, this turned out to be a cracked steam pipe in the engine room. In the meantime, the reinforcements, now very optimistically named the 3rd Pacific Squadron, set sail from Tallinn under the command of the elderly Admiral Nebogatov. The Admiralty ordered him to rendezvous with the main fleet with the following instructions. And I quote, You are to join up with Rozhdevensky, whose route is unknown to us. <laughs> so, basically... Uh, he's out there somewhere, sort of around Africa. You'll find him. <laughs> It'll be fine. <laughs> God. Of course, Rozhevensky had no intention of joining up with what he described as 
an archaeological collection of naval architecture, and it must have appeared to him that he was being pursued around the globe by a fleet of ghost ships. However, despite the odds stacked against them, and despite Admiral Rozdevensky's determined efforts to avoid them, on the 11th of May 1905, the 3rd Pacific Squadron, having made good progress for a collection of old tubs, did join the main fleet off the coast of Indochina. And they brought with them the first news from home that the fleet had had for the best part of seven months. And that news was all mutiny, <laughs> unrest and revolution. Which, as I'm sure you can imagine, did absolutely nothing to raise the morale of the crews as they sailed for their date with destiny with the Japanese fleet. A date, well, technically a couple of dates, 27th to the 29th of May 1905 to be precise, which keen students of history may have also already recognised as the date of the Battle of Tsushima, where the 38 surviving ships of the Russian Empire faced off in battle against 89 Japanese ships, lost 4,380 dead, 5,917 captured, six battleships sunk, one coastal battleship sunk, why you would send a coastal battleship around the Horn of Africa to attack the Japanese is anybody's guess, but they did, and one of them was sunk. Fourteen other ships were sunk, seven ships were captured, six ships were disarmed, for the price of 117 Japanese casualties, 583 injured, and three torpedo boats sunk. It was the first time ever a European power had lost a war to an Asian nation. And that, boys and girls, was the epic, absolutely true, 18,000 mile journey of the Voyage of the Damned. And that brings us to the end of this episode of Mingles with Jingles. There is just one other thing that I wanted to leave you with, because inspired by last week's episode of Mingles with Jingles, incompetent camera minion Eddie revealed to me that he he had some video footage that was also lost in the Adpocalypse, and I'm going to slap it onto the end of this episode. Do you remember my ice bucket challenge? Do you even remember the ice bucket challenge? It was a thing a few years ago. I still have the footage. Well, I do now. Eddie found it for me. So you can thank incompetent camera minion Eddie uh, for the closer of this week's episode of Mingles with Jingles. So that's it for this week. As always, take care, and I'll catch you next time. So it turns out I've been nominated to do this ice bucket challenge at least a hundred times over the course of the last week and um, you guys don't seem to understand how this works. I'm an evil gnome genius. I don't get buckets of water poured over me. I pour them over other people. That's what I have witless minions for. <laughs> Say hello Eddie. <laughs> Remember, it's all for a good cause. Don't you know who I am? <laughs>